The question of secularism and post-secularism defines our contemporary. What is the place of religion in public life? Are religious questions and social questions separate or connected? Are religious beliefs and practices necessarily opposed to a secular worldview? Hello, I am Prathama Banerjee. Today we have with us Rajiv Bhargav, whose work has had a defining influence on debates on secularism and post-secularism in South Asia. Welcome, Rajiv. Secularism, both as concept and practice, has been your abiding intellectual concern. I want to begin from perhaps your most widely read essay on the topic, Reimagining Secularism, published in 2013 in the Economic and Political Weekly. In this essay, you say that the global crisis of political secularism, which you distinguish from ethical secularism, and maybe you can give us a sentence on the distinction, uh, requires us to reimagine secularism itself as a concept. Drawing on your study of actual practices of secularism in India, you propose a definition of secularism as that of principled distance of the state from multiple religions. You imply that the European definition of secularism as a strict division between church and state presumes that there is only one religion and one church in a society, a presumption that holds true neither for India nor indeed for today's Europe. Could we then begin by you explaining the concept of political secularism as principled distance, which the state deploys in order to manage power relations, and this is crucial in your argument, power relations between and within religions. Thank you, Prathama, for inviting me. Uh, I think there are two questions there. One is a question about the distinction between political secularism on the one hand and ethical secularism on the other. And the other question is about how one reimagines political secularism uh, to mean what I call principal distance. So I'll answer these questions in that order. I think uh, for me, uh, if secularism is broadly taken to mean uh, either a life without religion or a life with multiple religions, then Ethical secularism is a kind of a general uh, moral uh, philosophy on how to live your life well in a non-religious or a religiously plural world. Now, uh, my work is more on political secularism rather than on, you know, the secular worldview or on what I call ethical secularism. And... Uh, until I wrote um, a previous essay in the Economic and Political Weekly, which was published in 1992, people hadn't actually made uh, a distinction of this kind. And uh, they were constantly uh, confusing, conflating the two. And uh, they were also making the claim that uh, you can be a political secularist only if you're an ethical secularist. Uh, which basically meant that political secularism is something that follows from a certain worldview in which religion has no place, religion has disappeared, or religion has been completely marginalized. Now, I, I sort of uh, bait that distinction because, uh, as I said, political secularism uh, doesn't have to presuppose that you are also an ethical secularist. Believers and non-believers can both agree on, on political secularism. It's a, you, can, you can have a believer's justification for why religion and state must be separated for certain values, but you can also have a non-believer's uh, justification or a non-practitioner's justification of why the two should be separated. And if the answer to both is yes and there is a convergence, then both believers and non-believers can agree on political secularism. Okay? So that's the... 
that's what my work is on, political secularism. Now to the second question about reimagining secularism. Say the American attitude that, you know, let's leave religion alone. That's its own sphere of jurisdiction. Uh, and the religion should also not interfere with the state. That's not possible because if you were to take the American standpoint in India, it means we will not be able to ban untouchability. We will not be able to allow uh, Dalits to enter temples if they choose to. Uh, you will not be able to make any changes in the uniform per civil code, uh, uh, sorry, in personal, the personal, personal codes, laws. Uh, yeah. personal laws. But if you w took the French stand, then the whole idea of respecting anything about religion will disappear. You'll only be hostile. Nor can you be, you t nor can you take a European, the rest of European uh, kind of approach where you favor one religion sure. by establishing one religion. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to adopt a policy of principal distance. Uh, you will uh, value some aspects of religion. You will uh, be very critical of other aspects of religion. So you have critical respect towards all religions. And you will have the state uh, uh, either uh, engaging with religion positively or negatively or disengaging from it, depending upon which, whether, which of these uh, enhances the values of freedom, equality, fraternity, or helps us undermine the two forms of domination that I mentioned earlier, inter-religious and intra-religious. So... Uh, there is no fixed uh, policy in India. Mm -hmm. There is no fixed approach to religion in India. Uh, it, the, each case has to be decided uh, on its merit. Correct. Yeah. And uh, it has to be, there are a lot of contextual reasoning. Uh, and that's why the role of the courts is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So, so Indian, the Indian, Indian secularism is, is really quite different from every other secularism. It is very distinctive. And I believe that uh, because most societies are now religiously diverse, uh, America, for example, or Europe, uh, large parts of Western Europe now have uh, Christian uh, faiths thrown together uh, with pre-Christian and post-Christian faiths, say Sikhism and Hinduism and Buddhism. And with this kind of diversity... And with uh, these religions not having gone through the process of secularization that European societies have gone through earlier, you will find the same problems of not being able to di distinguish the social from the religious in Europe as you do in India. And therefore, uh, I think the policy of principal distance will be a much good, more... A national uh, export. Will be a uh, national from export India. from India. So principal distance as a way to manage inter- and intra-religious domination. That's very pithily put. So, uh, so that reminds me that in India, in a kind of common sense, uh, uh, citizen, citizenly common sense, there are two ways of thinking about religion in modern times. One is to speak like Gandhi and say, all religions are good at heart and Sarvadharma, Sadbhav, uh, and such like. Or to say like Ambedkar, that no, all religions are not necessarily equally good. And some religions should be the object of stringent criticism. And he went on to criticize, as we know, Dharma Shastrik, Hinduism uh, all his life, and then just chose and said that Buddhism was a better religion. Uh, by both religious and social and political parameters. Now, that's not something that is easy to do in today's public sphere. Uh, so I just want to take you to the question of caste uh, from your, your idea of principled distance. And in fact, uh, in an essay that you wrote uh, recently, forthcoming perhaps, or maybe it's out, uh, it's very beautifully named, Hegel, Taylor, and the phenomenology of broken spirits. Um, you actually place caste and degraded labor at the heart of a post-colonial reading of Hegel's master-slave dialectic. 
So do you think that Indian secularism, by way of principled distance, has made the criticism of caste internal to the secularism problematic? Or would you say, as Ambedkar very often felt, that caste is always already uh, separated as a social question as opposed to a very different religion secularism question? So I think, uh, uh, look, uh, the term religion is, the, is, a, is a problem in the Indian context. But if we break it up, I think we can think of it uh, as having two dimensions or really covering two pretty separate things. One is what we might call ethics which is uh, your idea of self-fulfillment, self-realization, whether it's individual or collective, uh, and also different soteriologies, uh, salvific uh, paths, and so on. Now, that's one uh, sort of... Uh, religion can be uh, used to uh, subsume all this. And as you know, in India, there's never been... a a single path. Correct. There have always been multiple paths, and so multiple ethics. There is what we might call ethical pluralism. And when we talk about religious pluralism, we're really talking about this religio-philosophical pluralism. So that's one thing. The second is uh, what you might call uh, 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 norms of social interaction. So what is it that you can and not or cannot do in relation to others? Uh, how do you you know, whether you dine with them, who you get married to, uh, what kind of job do you do, and what is the significance of, of that job, uh, uh, who all are you to serve uh, if, when you do that job. I mean, all these questions are part of what we might call norms of social interaction. Correct. Now, what's called dharma uh, but you can say in, in the dharma shastric mode. Yes, in the dharma shastric mode. Social conduct. Yes, right, social mm. conduct. Vyavahara. Vyavahara, correct. Now, uh, religion can be uh, in when you the, the word religion really covers both. Correct. Mm -hmm. The connection between them can be very loose, as I believe it has been in India, or it can be very tight, as it has been at certain points of time in the Abrahamic religions. So, so the word religion is right, really quite appropriate in that context. When there is a very tight connection between ethics and social norms, you choose one ethical path and then you are choosing a, a whole lot of rituals that go with it and you're also choosing a, a wide, a, a narrow uh, range of uh, social norms that are uh, specific to a certain ethical mode. So, so you don't choose one but not the other. In India, on the other hand, funnily, you can, you, can be, you can choose whichever ethics you want as long as you have your location in the social structure rigidly specified, okay. right? Mm -hmm. so, so your adherence to the caste system in a very funny way allows you to, to make an ethical choice. And it's not just choosing one or the other. You can actually embrace many and you can move very swiftly from one to the other. So all kinds of possibilities are there as long as you have this location. Now, the point is whether, to, whether religion is to be used for one or the other or for both. In Dharam Shastrik uh, Brahminism, it's actually used for both. Correct. That's mm -hmm. the only religion in India in one sense. The re for the rest of the people, these are two separate things. And therefore, you can be... Uh, uh, you know, you can you can be a Christian, but also belong to a certain caste. You can be a Muslim, belong belong to a caste, and you can do any. You know, you can choose any of the various ways of being Hindu mm -hmm. and belong to a particular mm -hmm. caste. So, the caste position and your ethical perspective don't have to go together. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, for by nineteenth century, I think it was established that Hinduism bo com combined has both these elements. 
So the caste system, in my view, became central part of Hinduism. Uh, unlike in the past, when for a lot of people, unlike the Dharamshastric Brahmin and Brahmins, the two were quite separate from each other. Uh, so, and, and you could use the term religion for one or the other, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. we are to retrospectively use it. Sure. Now, the, the question is that today, uh, there are many caste-related issues which are outside the religious domain, but there are many which are still within the religious domain. So there are some practices which you can always say are sanctioned by a particular Hindu scripture. But there are many things which are, you know, which are caste uh, related, which are not so, uh, uh, which are not uh, part of... Uh, 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 Any scriptural yeah, or yeah, doctrinal. That, no, not uh, a part of doctrinal or scriptural. Correct, yeah. So... Uh, but I, would you then say that the, the way that... Secularism as a principal distance has evolved historically in India. It has not intervened adequately. For instance, it has intervened uh, strongly uh, regarding temple management. Mm. Let me put it like mm. that, including the mm. management of wealth and mm. such like. Mm. But has it not intervened enough so, yeah. in the caste? So when we, if, uh, if secularism mm. is uh, against not religiosity, but against institutionalized religious domination of both kinds, intra and inter, then in intra-religious domination, you have gender and caste hierarchies. Correct. So secularism has to be against both uh, 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 inferior role of women, which are sanctioned by religion, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, oppression, of, oppression of, of caste, caste and which are sanctioned by religion. Correct. Now, that is how it should have been. Mm -hmm. The caste and the gender discourse should have been an integral part of the discourse of inter-religious domination, that is to say oppression of minorities. Mm -hmm. uh, our political movement should also have been like that. But unfortunately, what has happened is that the Dalit question, the women's question, and the minority questions have, have been become, yeah, dis disaggregated. disaggregated. Quite so. and, and that has been a disaster. And that is why uh, you can, you know, that's why people, uh, a lot of people believe, for example, that secularism has nothing to do with Hindus. Uh, it has only to do with my, with uh, Muslims uh, in particular. Mm. And uh, once you see as something to do with Muslims, you can say that it's only pro-Muslim. Mm -hmm. And and then from then you can go on to say it's anti-Hindu. Correct. Well, yeah. secularism has always been anti all religions and pro all religions. The basic idea of secularism is critical respect for all religions. So you respect what is valuable in mm -hmm, each, mm -hmm. and you disrespect what is not. And if if there is a caste practice, if there is caste practice in Islam, and it's then you have to attack that. And sure. if you if you have uh, a very uh, a, a strong gender hierarchies in Islam or Christianity, for that matter, you have to attack that from a secular perspective, not just go against the caste system within Hinduism. Sure. Which is what ban on untouchability and so on has been. You have used the term post secular uh, uh, a couple of times in your recent writings, uh, um, and and you and you and you uh, define it in an interesting way, which is to say that uh, post secular is when we re realize. That religion, and you said this just now, that religion has also valuable aspects uh, uh, which can feed into uh, larger political and social cultures as also a re realization that religion has never really gone away. So uh, just wondering uh, whether your usage of post-secular and your... Uh, use of the other term that you often use, especially uh, when you write about ancient Indian traditions, secularity. Mm. So secularism, be it of the Indian variety or otherwise, post-secular as our contemporary moment uh, of both the return of religion and the return of appreciation of religion and secularity. Mm as something which is not confined mm. to our modern day experience, but as something yeah. which has existed in history in various forms, in 
so I would like you to go over the subtle conceptual distinctions and even the journey that you have made intellectually from thinking secularism to thinking post-secularism to thinking secularity right. as such. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I think, uh, I mean, neither secularity nor post-secular are terms that uh, I have uh, Invented. introduced. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. These are terms that were around and I have had to respond to them. Uh, so, as you rightly pointed out, uh, post-secular uh, is, is, a, is both a description and a normative assessment. As a description, it does refer to the fact that religion has come back uh, or that it was there but we didn't notice it and so on. Uh, and, but it's also uh, uh, the realization that uh, unlike in the secular condition, when religion was believed to be a burden, mm -hmm. which you have to get rid of, it's either a source of oppression or a, or a storehouse of falsehood and superstition, uh, superstition. Uh, uh, and therefore, you secular condition was an emancipatory struggle against both oppression and falsehood. The post-secular, as you correctly understood, is a condition where you realize that that's not an accurate uh, st story about religion or about or as a historical narrative. That uh, religion always had, religion has always been around and religion always had something meaningful, uh, some insights. Uh, it's been a, it's been a, a, a reservoir of uh, folk, t folk wisdom uh, and that uh, you have to uh, have a different relationship as uh, than, than what, you know, a certain mainstream enlightenment uh, had proposed. So that's uh, post-secular. And uh, in, terms of the, in terms of political secularism, uh, if secular is to marginalize religion or to eliminate religion or to, 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 uh, to not notice religious differences and to think of all religion as identical, post-secular is uh, both... Uh, to accept that you have to deal with religion um, in, in a political way and also deal with religious differences. So religious diversity is something to be addressed. Now, if that is the case, that is how you understand post-secular, then surely India has always been post-secular. Correct. You I mean, do I'm, I'm, say that I'm, often. I'm, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm, this is, I'm not very happy with this term. Mm -hmm. But if I've been forced to use this term, I would say you know, this is a condition that India has always had. Mm -hmm. We've never rejected any religious or philosophical tradition completely. Uh, and we've never had the kind of historical narrative that Europe had built of mm -hmm. emancipation mm -hmm. mm -hmm. from religion. And, you know, uh, we've always had this dual approach, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, both, uh, you know, what I call critical respect. And our political strategies have also have had to mm -hmm. deal with this very nuanced understanding of of, of religion with uh, as a morally ambivalent and therefore to embody in in its policies something like uh, this critical respect you've got to have principal mm -hmm. distance mm -hmm. of some kind so so I, I think uh, so, so what about secularity yes because, so I uh, think yeah. that this whole post secular thing uh -huh. actually it's a way to say that we've always been post secular is to say that forget it it's not something which is relevant in our context right I Correct. mean that's my uh, right. that's my take right. on it yeah now, secularity is something interesting. Uh, secularity is actually something in our background con conditions uh, in which you uh, make a distinction between what is religion and what is not religion. I mean, uh -huh. you know, you've got to decide. After all, this is, and this is not something that you have to take, a, a, this, these are not matters of individual decisions. These are historical sure. processes, as sure. you and I both know. Uh, but uh, the, but what is covered by the term religion and what is left out of it is itself a historical issue. Certainly, you know, when Buddhism comes or when the Buddha, Buddha's teachings come, uh, this question about how we treat other people becomes central and becomes part of what is called... Religion. What is, you know, part of the ethic. And therefore, mm -hmm. if religion was to use... To use this social interaction mm -hmm. bit, mm -hmm. karuna, kindness, mm. 
uh, and in later be. Christianity, charity mm. and so on, mm. will be part of religion. Mm. 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 So, it's, so uh, that background uh, uh, condition uh, in which uh, the, what is religion and what is not religion is constituted, that, is, that frame is what is called secularity. Take us through your recent turn to ancient and medieval Indian history. How does a theorist of the contemporary engage the past? How different are you from a historian or an Indologist in speaking to the contemporary via past concepts and ideas? Uh, I think, let me start by being a little autobiographical here. Uh, I had tried to make an argument uh, about the distinctiveness of Indian secularism and how Indian secularism is different from European, American, you know, West, broadly Western. Now, where is the distinctiveness, where does this distinctive, distinctiveness lie? I think there are two possible ways of looking at it. One is to say that, look, this is a Western concept when it comes to India, it has to adapt to the Indian social, economic, political situation. And it is in this adaptation that something new is invented. But if you wish, uh, you know, to add to this, uh, uh, you know, the, these various factors uh, which call for adaptation, the cultural mm -hmm. element, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then, of course, uh, you have to look at the history of these different cultural traditions which also become very important because you can talk about social and political more or less in in the uh, uh, from uh, you know from the point of view of the present uh, in this case the 20th century mm -hmm. but when you start talking about cultural influences then and non-Western cultural influences, then you have to begin dealing with traditions, uh, Indian traditions. And, and uh, I came to the conclusion that uh, Indian secularism is really shaped not just by the you know, socio-economic and political factors, but also by uh, the cultural traditions of India. And that meant going back in time. Correct. And there are always... A, a, this means actually looking at the entire history. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, this is not a job of one person. Uh, the whole lot of people who have to be involved in working out the patterns of state-religion relationships in, in India in the past. I thought that we could look at certain texts in order to figure out what this pattern might have been like. And um, I believe that there, are f there is a family of concepts which do the work that modern secularism is supposed to do, which existed in the past. Correct. And, uh, for example, I mean, I could have gone to many figures, but the person that I chose to go to is a person who is very strongly associated, even in our own times, with uh, a certain, certain kinds of proto-secularism. And that is Ashoka. What Ashoka tries to do is to first acknowledge that there are a diversity of religio-philosophical groups in the 3rd century BCE. And then um, he is working out a political morality or a public morality of how they should engage with each other and how he as a king should engage with them. Right. And when he talks about uh, their mutual engagement, he talks about uh, vach gutti, which is a form of sanyama, mm -hmm. uh, restraint of speech, which is a particular instance of, uh, of uh, self-restraint. And very interestingly, this restraint of speech is also of two kinds. One is what we may call other related restraints. Uh, self-restraint, which is, you know, I shouldn't do this to that person because it will degrade him, it will humiliate him, it will hurt him. But there's another kind of uh, self-restraint, which is self-related, that, you know, if I were to harm another person, I'm actually damaging myself. 
if I uh, am speaking in a an immoderate, unreasonable tone and calling other people names, then it is not just he or she who I'm damaging. I'm in certain ways uh, distorting myself. So for my sake too, I should exercise some self-restraint. Mm-hmm. So bhava shuddhi is very important. It's in sanyama, but uh, vach gutti and bhava shuddhi are all to be read together. Correct. Correct. And this is something, you know, so this is a very different, you can say it's, you know, these are forms of secularism or part of a, not secularism, but forms of something mm-hmm. uh, which mm-hmm. are part of a family of concepts of which modern secularism is also a part. In order to take forward the work on histories of religious conflict and coexistence, you have set up the Parikh Institute of Indian Thought at CSDS. Rajiv, we look forward to collaborative research coming out of this institutional initiative as well as more from you individually. Thank you for listening to Speaking Otherwise. 